Okay, now let's look on to some um, more interesting orders. Uh, these are the Psychoptera through the Hemipterans. So let's start with the Psychoptera. Psychoptera are the wood lice or the bark lice or the book lice. So psychos means rubbed or gnawed and terra means wings. This has to do with the way that they feed. Now, the Psychoptera are very abundant worldwide, but they're often overlooked. Whenever we have these overlooked organisms, it means that they don't have a lot of impact on animals or on humans or on things that we care about. So they're not really pests in our, our mind. They don't do a lot of um, real damage. They can cause some damage, but they're not as annoying to us as other organisms. So they tend to be overlooked. These are the most primitive types of lice. We uh, consider this simply because their mouth parts show very little, little modification from that basic mandibulate condition. So if you think about those mandibles that we had you dissect in lab and that I showed you in lecture several times, these look almost exactly the same. So they've got that uh, labrum, that labium, the mandibles, the maxillae, the palps, that um, uh, clypus, all of that sort of stuff all there. The main difference is they have what is called that expanded clypus. So remember that clypus is attached to that upper lip, that labrum area. Okay? And so this means that they have a very large prominent head. So this is how I always remembered them when I was learning this was, you know, you think psycho head, large head. There we go. They, they have that expanded clypus. Um, so Really large prominent head, really expanded clypus is the major characteristic for the book lice, the bark lice, the wood lice. They live in moist terrestrial environments. So they live on land. They need a lot of water simply because they are very small and they have a pretty permeable cuticle. So we'll find them a lot in leaf litter. We'll find them under stones, under bark, hence the name bark lice, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, they very rarely come into contact with humans or with animals, and they almost never cause economic damage. Uh, every once in a while, they will get into books, hence the name book lice, uh, because they can feed on that uh, cellulose, on that paper. But they're not really that common. So we don't do a lot of stuff with them. What is interesting about them is they have excellent powers of dispersal. So they can go from place to place very easily. They have very, very um, adapted wings or large wings. They can move quickly. So they're usually among the first insects to colonize new what we call islands. So an island, when we talk about this in an ecological sense, can be, you know, just a a body of land amongst a bunch of water. Sure, that's an island. If a new one comes up, the psychoptera can be among the first to go there. But an island is also considered a new little area where there's nothing else in it inside a normal habitat. So if you have, say, a, a new burned out air place or a, a disturbed habitat, let's say we uh, a fire came through, burned everything, nothing is living there, that's considered an island am among a... Uh, a normal habitat. So the psychoptera are from the first ones to go right back there. They can move very quickly and they do. And so they're the first to, or among the first to colonize these new islands or invade disturbed habitats. All right. Now, a much more common type of louse is the theraptera. These are known as lice. So they're not any specific type of lice, whatever. So the P-H-T-H-I-R, that literally means lice. So we, we named these things lice in the Greek and the Latin. After a means wingless, so they do not have wings. These are lice without wings, unlike the psychoptera, which have wings. So they're very closely related to psychoptera, but they do not have those wings. So we change them into um, this new group or this new order. Now, the uh, lineage of the theroptera has changed a lot over time. I'm going to teach you the more uh, simplistic lineage or the more simplistic breakup of these of this group, simply because a lot of the basic veterinary literature, a lot of the papers that you're going to read, a lot of the stuff you're going to come across for these lice, break it up this way. 
if you get into medical entomology, if you've taken it with me, or if you get into uh, higher entomological classes, you're going to find that we break these up very differently later on. I want you to know what you are going to read in your veterinary textbooks. I want you to know what you're going to read in the literature that you're going to be picking up when you work in the field with animals. So that's how I'm going to teach it here, but know that there are different classifications for this. It really doesn't matter. It all ends up with the same species anyhow. But we divide these into two suborders that I want you to know for this class. The first is called Anaplura. These are the sucking lice. So these will feed on blood. And the Malophaga, these are called the chewing lice. Now, it's that Malophaga that is being debated by some people. Some people will break it up into a whole bunch of different types. So you'll have Anaplura plus three others or four others or two other um, uh, orders or suborders in this case. I want you to know Anaplura and Malophaga simply because Malophaga comes up most often in the literature in your potential field of study. Okay, so... The distinction between these two is based on the presence or the absence of mandibles. Mandibles uh, for chewing versus a cone like a piercing and sucking mouth part. Okay, so presence or absence of mandibles. So the chewing lice, as you might imagine, have large, well developed mandibles. The sucking lice have a cone like mouth part that is for piercing and sucking. So Anaplura versus Malophaga. Now, the lice do uh, vector some diseases. Uh, they can cause a lot of problems in uh, animals. So those of you who work with animals on a regular basis, you will find these on pretty much every fur-bearing mammal has some sort of uh, highly adapted louse that will attach to its fur. And if you remember back a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some of these uh, adaptations of parasitic organisms and one of the major adaptations was in the claw or in the tarsi of these uh, animals that had to or these insects that had to hang on to fur as ectoparasites so if you look at these tarsi here you can see that they got these obvious claws and that's very different from the obvious claws on these chewing lice so it's sucking lice chewing lice so you can look at these claws to see where they're going to be hanging on so Every fur-bearing animal has a very highly adapted louse. And in lab, you're going to get uh, examples of lots and lots of different malophaga, lots of different chewing lice that they can, um, you can see under the microscope. And these will come from cattle, from dogs, from cats, from goats, from sheep. Uh, they all have their own adapted thing. All right. So very adapted. Now, they can spread disease. Like I said, they can vector disease. Uh, there are some pretty common uh, human-borne diseases that are louse-borne, that are louse-vectored. One is uh, pretty common in wartime. We call it trench fever. It was very, very common in World War I. It was spread by uh, body lice as uh, soldiers were forced to live in very crowded and unsanitary conditions. So these lice would move from person to person. They uh, traveled via direct contact, and so they would vector on this trench fever. So there are a couple of other diseases that you will read about, you know, but you'll be able to read about those. Um, finally, the egg stage of the louse. These eggs are called nits. These nits are, uh, you can see it right here, and the way that these nits are laid is the female will spend her entire life on the host and she will lay individual eggs, usually on individual hairs. So she will take this special, very, very tough glue and she will glue the, um, the eggs to the individual hair or the individual uh, fur strands of the animal or of the human. So if you are trying to get rid of a uh, lice infestation, you have to get rid of not only the adults and the nymphs, but you also have to get rid of these eggs. And these eggs are tough. That glue is very strong. Those eggs are highly, highly sclerotized. So they're hard to kill. Uh, a lot of uh, chemicals don't penetrate them. So you have to physically remove Move them. Oh, 
madre, no, viejo, ni que fuera para ese capa la wea. Ay, es que está todo vivo, si ¿Sí se mueve. All right, now on to a very tiny organism that we call the Thysanoptera. So you've seen Thysan before. You remember Thysan? That means fringed. So Thysan was Thysanura with the fringe tails, the uh, um, fire brats and the uh, silverfish. Now we're talking Thysanoptera, which are fringed wings. These are commonly known as thrips and they have these wings you can see them up here four wings and hind wings that are not like any other wing we've seen before instead they're very paddle like so they're these straight stick like wings with fringe hanging off of them hence the name fringe wings now thysanoptera or the thrips are very tiny organisms they are all well under three millimeters long sometimes even smaller and they, most of the species will feed on plants. So these are a, uh, a plant feeder, a phytophagous insect. They cause a lot of problems with uh, agriculture. So you can get a lot of thrip-borne diseases. You can get a lot of thrip damage, thrips damage. So when I say the word thrips, um, the word thrips is both singular and plural. So there's no such thing as a thrip. It's a thrips and then thrips. You know, that's how we go. Um, so these thrips are very, very tiny. And they feed by scraping the surface of plants off. So you might have seen at oh, farmer's markets or places like that, especially on fruit, you might see some damage on the outside of the fruit and oranges or an apples or whatever that looks sort of like a scraping damage. Uh, it's usually a brown plaque-like uh, damage on the outside of this fruit. That's thrips damage. So these are these little tiny organisms. Now, what's interesting about thrips is they fly in a very different manner. If you look at those wings, they look like they can't fly, right? There's no way they can get lift. Well, remember what we said about that really high surface to volume ratio? When we get to this size, they are so incredibly tiny. Their relationship with air is very different from larger organisms. So they really have no relationship with gravity at this point. They're so small and that surface to volume ratio is so high that gravity will not pull them down. So they don't have to worry about actually getting lift and trying to break the bonds of that physical force of gravity. And the air itself is so thick around them, it's like they're swimming. So if you think more about are these swimming paddles versus lifting wings, then yeah, you can see how these things can move. So these swimming paddles, you could easily paddle through a pool with these sorts of things. And that's basically the way that thrips fly. They paddle through the air as if they are swimming through water. So they swim around through this air and they can get from place to place very, very efficiently. So they can cause a lot of problems when it comes to agriculture and they can spread plant disease. If you go on to a um, plant class or a crop insect class, you're gonna learn about thrips like mad because they do cause a lot of problems. They cause a lot of damage and a lot of uh, disease can be spread. Uh, a lot of uh, cosmetic damage can happen, which means you can't sell the fresh produce. All right. The last order we're going to be looking at today is the hemipterans. Hemi means half and terra means wings. So the hemipterans are a group that we call the true bugs. So if you've ever talked to an entomologist and you've talked to them about quote unquote bugs, you may have seen us twitch a little bit. This is because not all insects are considered bugs in our world, but all bugs are considered insects. So the only thing that we officially call bugs are hemipterans. That's why you get that little like eye twitch when you talk to an insect, to an entomologist and say, hey, yeah, I found this beetle. Look at this bug. And we can just go, eh, it's not a, it's not a bug. It's that's coleoptera. That's a beetle. Ah, you know, that's because we have an order that we call the true bugs. Now, this hemiptera, this is an interesting 
uh, order. It's named for the wings, hence the name Hemi, Terra, or half wing. So Hemi means half, Terra means wings. They have these uh, four wings that are uh, very leathery and very sheath-like. So they have these half and half wings, while the uh, bottom half of those uh, hind wings are membranous in general. So this allows a lot of these orders to fly and that gives some protection to these orders. Uh, this is pretty much a catch-all order. So you're going to see a ridiculous number of weird-looking bugs in this particular group. So we have everything in this group from these plant feeders uh, down here. Look at these half wings. These plant feeders here, they're phytophagus. Uh, to predators, these are what we call you know, toe biters or giant uh, water insects. These, right around this time of year, will actually fly out and about. You might see these around your porch light if you live near water. Uh, you can see these, um, these really large water bugs. This is a male that carries its uh, young on its back, its eggs on its back. Uh, these are plant hoppers here, plant feeders. This is a tree hopper. Look at that crazy elytra going on there, this crazy uh, wings and this little horn right here. Then we have these looking things. These are called scale insects. This is the cottony cushion scale. Looks like no bug you've ever seen before. You can barely even see that it has legs, let alone um, head, thorax, and abdomen. And then this one, this is the insect that produces a uh, casing over itself. And it sits underneath these casings on these plants. So it doesn't even, you can't even see the insect part of it. It's just this solid casing. So everything looks very, very strange. And it runs the gamut of what they feed on. So a lot of them are plant feeders, but others are predatory. Others will feed on blood. Others can spread disease. So we do have vectors of plant and animal disease in this group. It's just this huge, huge thing. Now, this group includes things like the kissing bug and the bed bug. So we will be talking about Hemiptera later on, especially with the kissing bug and Chagas disease and all that sort of stuff that's coming up. Uh, but the bed bug, we won't spend a lot of time talking about because that's more of a, a human uh, problem. But if you come into my medical entomology class, you will uh, we will talk a lot about bed bugs. You've probably heard about it in the news. They are in this particular order. Now, those that feed on uh, plants, those uh, organisms tend to feed on the liquid of plants in this group. So they have those piercing and sucking mouth parts. They will tap into the xylem and the phloem, depending on their um, setup and their, their life history. So remember back to your basic biology, you got the xylem and the phloem. The xylem carries water in plants. The phloem carries all that sap in plants. So if you think about it, that's a really, really high quality meal for these organisms. But that's a lot of liquid coming in too. And so this is one of those insects that I talked about early on where I said that, you know, we, we go through that, that crop, the, uh, the foregut, the midgut, the hindgut, the hindgut is responsible for reabsorbing a bunch of water and then they, they poop out, usually dry poop. Those insects that feed on liquid do not get rid of dry fecal matter. They have so much liquid coming in that water is not a problem for them. So their hindgut doesn't absorb all of the water possible. Instead, they will end up urinating out usually a really sugary substance called honeydew. So this honeydew is this uh, true bug or, or other insect um, urine-like substance, very, very high in sugars, very, very high in liquid. It's a sticky, sap-like or honey-like substance. If you've ever parked your car underneath a tree that has a lot of, oh, cicadas on it, cicadas is in the, are in this uh, hemiptera group, or other plant feeders, and you come back and there's like a sticky crap all over your car, all that syrup stuff, that's honeydew. That is insect urine. So they've just basically been peeing all over your car and it's everywhere. So this honeydew is actually a great food source for a lot of other animals. Ants go crazy for honeydew. I mean, think about it, it's just syrup. So they, they love it. Um, other organisms will go crazy for honeydew because it's a really high quality, high concentrated food. Uh, form of sugars that these true bugs have liberated from the plants. They've taken what they needed and they've uh, let the rest go onto your car or wherever else. Awesome. All right. With that, let me know if you have any questions.